When the Nintendo Entertainment System became more well known in terms of its capabilities, companies and developers began upgrading their products to better match a more real experience for their games, or what you can try to achieve as a real experience. I think the biggest upgrade to a specific genre had to have been sports. Once you could do a lot more with the engine and design of a game, the difference between launch title sport games and later releases is almost night and day. The graphics, movement, and accuracy to the real thing while having its own unique features due to being implemented in a virtual setting is almost something else. We already went and covered Nintendo's absolute finest sports titles for the NES. Now we're going to look at some more sports titles with a lot more variety to them, some of which that are really good that weren't made by Nintendo. First on the list is Tecmo Bowl, which from what I heard is apparently better than most modern Madden games. Now listen, I'm going to be real, the closest I've ever come to an interest in football was every February when the Super Bowl aired and I had to root for any team opposing the Patriots. God, you don't know how great it was finally seeing the Phillies work their shit. The only team I've ever rooted for was the New York Giants, and that was only really because all the football fans in my family liked the New York Giants. And to be fair, could you blame them? They had a fantastic run through the 2000s and early 2010s. But for Tech Mobile, you just have city names as representation for football teams. Close enough, but it's just the city names. They do use the last names of real players for their characters, but that's just it. They just use their last names for it. You could tell they really wanted it to be like the real shit without having to deal with all the licensing bullshit. Your goal is to pick a team and then knock down each team in some sort of weekly fashion until Championship Sunday where you go down with the last team available. I had a lot of trouble getting into this game. For one, every time any sort of field event occurs, like a tackle or goal, you have to pick a plan. And I'm going to be honest, I don't know shit about plans in football, bro. I know, I'm a very backwards individual. So I try to pick the ones that look like they give me control of my character the best. But another thing I had to deal with was the way the AI worked. Because there's no difficulty setting, that means all AI, regardless of round or team, are always the same. And they probably knew that, which is why they're always really tough to deal with or fake out. Eventually, I was getting to a point where the game was becoming less fun fun despite trying my hardest to try and play the game the way they wanted me to. So eventually I dropped my team and did a bit of online research and from what I gathered it's about something something Los Angeles with something something passe that something something Bo Jackson somewhere involved and then something something more and damn this is exactly what I needed to get through this game. Oh yeah I'm busting their asses down no one can catch me. Oh fuck this, I don't even like football. Good game. Next! Oh god damn it. Well, I did say I was going to look at it here, so... I guess it's better to get this game out of the way than to have to keep holding it off from being reviewed. Mm. So, Super Dodgeball is a game about dodgeball. Not good enough? Fine. The game has three modes, a single player championship mode, a multiplayer mode, and a beanball mode. The single player mode runs you through a championship tournament against a variety of international groups as a singular American college team. Unlike dodgeball in real life, you only have six players on each team and they all have some sort of health bar. Yeah, I don't remember dodgeball being like that. I guess they just had to make the game more balanced and not let each match run through 30 seconds. Now, unlike most games where each passing team gets more and more difficult, the game does allow you to select your difficulty from the start, which I think is a good choice instead of just increasing the AI's competency level over each match. The multiplayer mode is simply you and your friends picking between the teams and then just doing the do until the last person on whoever's team is knocked out. Simple. The beanball mode meanwhile is simply you and your teammates all gathering in a circle to test the dodgeball on each other until one man is left standing. Being real, I don't like this game. It looks well graphically for an NES game, but if they sacrifice the playability of the game in order to support a stronger look to the game, then I think that wasn't probably the best option. For one, the game runs at a pretty inconsistent 25 to 30 frames per second, and on some levels it feels like it chugs down to 20. Also, there is bad sprite flickering in this game, especially when characters are aligned on the same axis. Usually this sort of problem doesn't happen a lot, and later NES games would find ways to avoid this problem, but here with all the movement and action going on, it's just too much. It's one thing to have a pretty choppy frame rate, but to add that along with the sprite flickering just makes me think this game was hella rushed to get onto the console. Either 
either that or like I said before, they sacrifice the playability of the game in order for the graphics to look good, which I just think is just the wrong way to do it. Now there's nothing wrong with the controls themselves outside of some of my inputs being eaten from the choppy frame rate, but still, even with decent enough controls, if your game isn't as responsive or as quick as what you're trying to input, it would have probably been best to not focus on the graphical output of the game. Definitely one I didn't care to leave off of quickly. Now this is where we start getting to the good games of this list. No hate to Tecmo Bowl, you were just featured first. It's Ice Hockey, and out of all the 1987 Nintendo sport game releases, this is by far the second best one. Sorry, we'll talk about the best one later. Now, Ice Hockey is nothing too spectacular with just CPUs, but with a friend, it's like a different experience. You have a variety of teams from different nations, both dissolved and unstable to pick from, but you can only pick up to only four characters in each team, all consisting of a thin skater, a fat skater, and a plus size skater. Personally, my setup is two fatties and two plus sizes. I don't like seeing my guys get knocked around easily. You don't even get to pick skaters for the side benches, so you know if one of your players is punished or the next round goes on, you could just switch your setup, but instead you're locked to the team setup you have the moment you press start from the menu select. You get to choose different times, but they're not in real time timers. They go by their own speed as per usual for most of these sports games. You can also choose the speed of how the game is played, but personally the character speeds don't feel much different, so I'm assuming it has slight speed variations in the multiplayer, but is really a difficulty selection for the single player against CPUs. Now that's not to say the CPUs are incapable of putting up a good fight, I mean for CPUs pro programmed on a very limited console in terms of computer storage and memory, they act pretty aggressive overall and are pretty hard to just blind shot through the goalie. They are definitely pretty good CPUs for their time. However, there's just something much more different about this game when playing with friends. It feels like an actual competition due to the very close quarter nature of ice hockey as a whole. I love it when I play as a plus size man and just fling the puck across the whole rink or just hogging the puck and circling around the rink just to troll my friend. I think what also adds into the intense competition is that you control two characters at once. The highlighted character, or one closest to the puck, which you always have to check just so you're not running off the screen wondering where you are, and the goalie. So if you're in a very close area between the two teams, you're basically trying to play defense in order to not get the puck in the goal, but also play as one of your guys in order to knock the puck away from the goal spot. Also when the goalie holds the puck, usually the CPUs will just walk away, meaning you can easily pass the puck to your teammates. When it comes to multiplayer, your opponent isn't going to give you a free puck pass. Alex, you can suck my dick for all the times you stayed right around the fucking goalie net, you cheap fuck. Though I won't lie, I was definitely playing Devious 2 during our matches. Since conflict is high during these close tense schisms, if two skaters were to have somehow make contact with each other and one of them is holding a puck, well, just watch yourself. Seriously, I love this game. Me and my friend have gone back to this one since we first played it back in 2020 when we were bored on some NES games online. Even if ice hockey isn't a favorite sport of yours, it's good to just to pick up this title for a bit. At least with a friend, because the intensity between you and your friend will make any AO3 writer cream just thinking about it. However, despite it being a game I hold to good value, especially with friends, nothing could ever peak as a favorite NES sports game to me than Punch-Out. Oh yeah, now this is my kind the game. Just beating the shit out of opponents straight from a World War II propaganda paper. I'll admit that a lot of these are pretty stereotypical representations of a boxer's nationality, but like, come on, that's the charm of this game. I really don't think that they meant it out of deprecation, especially since they are fucking tough as shit boxers you have to fight. It would be something else that the foreign boxers weren't much to put up a fight with. The only really negative stereotypes that should be addressed are of course some of the quotations in between matches. Now obviously this way of delivering lines can be seen as a translation thing, but even then some of these lines make no sense even if they were translated straight from the horse's mouth and are just a nip at their national cultures like Soda Popinski and Piston Honda. Also Super Macho Man looks like he's built off the body of Schwarzenegger, but the way he talks in his quotations make him sound like he's a teenage surfer straight from a pop culture Californian summer film. I brought back some takeout, so like, let's get down and pig out. Anyways, the name of the game is Punch Out. You go up against a variety of boxers and punch them out cold. There are 11 boxers in the game with 14 matches total, all of which are divided by boxing circuits. The first being the minor circuit with three boxers, the major circuit with four boxers, and the 
the world circuit with six boxers, only three of which are actually new fighters. The other three are rematch fights of earlier boxers, just with a more aggressive playstyle. Finally afterwards, if you manage to make your way through all of the circuits, you get to take on the Dream Fight, which depending on cartridge re-releases could either be Mike Tyson or Mr. Dream, a whitewashed version of Mike Tyson. Regardless, they both play exactly the same, by which I mean they will knock you the fuck out, man! The game itself is sort of a port of the original arcade release, though it's missing some few fighters in those ones and also doesn't share the same perspective. The game still works as is. They even justify not having the transparent fighter by just saying your boxer is just a really tiny man life. Either way, Little Mac can still throw good hands so long as you understand how the fighters work. And when you do, it actually becomes less of a score and fighting game and more of a puzzle game disguised with big burly men knocking your teeth out. Most of the boxers, even way later in the game, always have a set standard for each round and how to deal with the player's erratic movements and shots. Now to many kids, this is probably hard to notice, but as your psychological cognitive develops, it starts becoming more noticeable, so anyone who's just starting the game will most likely go through with it in trial and error. I've played the game many times before. In fact, it was one of my earliest NES games I got from the Wii U eShop. So for the most part, I still understood a lot of these guys' movement options and when to time hits to land stars or OKOs. Now that doesn't mean I was clean housing through the game because when you do something of the order you meant to or carry on to a further round where you're unfamiliar with how the AI is set up, then yeah, I started biting the bullet more. I honestly couldn't beat Mr. Dream in both a final fight and a decision. That's just how much I ate shit in the later half of the game. World Circuit was a lot more tough than I remember. Piston Honda and Bald Bull's rematches were pretty easy since they always had one move you can just sock them in the midst of it, but damn, Don Flamenco 2 was not pulling any punches. I had to wait for round 2 so he could go back to his taunting phase because his jabs felt so random to me and I was barely getting stars on him. The only fight I actually liked is Mr. Sandman but that's because he was the only one that had me on my toes for most of the fight. Also it doesn't help, he's just very intimidating overall. For example, most of these guys have like a little fanfare in their intro as they do something like tap dance in place or flex their muscles cause you know, they're manly boxers with sexy muscles that'll knock you out. But Mr. Sandman just opens up with this. Also doesn't help, he's very tolerant to damage all the while he'll knock you out with three chained uppercuts. Still found it weird how Super Macho Man was the circuit champion over Sandman. I think Sandman probably knocked more players out by double than Super Macho Man. Punch-Out is a fun boxing experience with a more puzzle and predictability game design to it. If you're new, it'll require a lot of trial and error, but if you're used to it, it's just really a good game to just run through until you're knocked out and eventually get a game over. Oh well, I want to move on to our next and final game. NES Open Golf Tournament is kind of a weird Mario games they have. I mean, it's not necessarily branded as a part of the Mario franchise, but it does host mostly Mario characters in it, even bringing back Daisy too. Although maybe I shouldn't be surprised, she did make her debut like a year before this game was released. Now at first this game wasn't giving off a good impression, I didn't know how different the clubs were, and even when looking at all the way the wind goes and the accuracy of the lineup, it still felt like my ball was always going a bit off course. My biggest issue, which I think eventually alleviated my discontent with the game, was the way you wind up the swing. I had no idea how this meter worked, and I was not able to get a proper swing most of the time or even just fail to hit it completely. Eventually though, after tinkering around with the clubs and giving it a few practice swings, I realized that you're actually trying to line up two things for a more precise swing. The first highlighter actually builds up the speed at which the ball will be hit, and then when the second highlighter comes out, you have to time that one to be as close to the white box on the meter so as to have a more accurate hit that would be a lot more closer to your lineup launch than you know just spamming it and hoping you get any length out of it. Even though I was getting used to the controls of the game pretty quickly and admire the sprite work and interface, you also have to understand that golf is not a favorite of mine. There's only so much in me that can look at a shaded green screen with blue and yellow spots scattered here and there and the same reused Mario animations when swinging the club. If you like golf games however, then this one is probably a favorite on the NES, at least from what I've heard. With over 10 hours of content? What the fuck? Is there like some secret world tour in every country imaginable? If you gotta thank this game for one thing, it's either making the Luigi and Daisy pair a thing, or for giving the Mario Bros these gangsta ass freedom loving overalls. God damn this fit is so clean on him. I hope they never get rid of the skin in Smash Bros. You know, when you put aside all the black box or launch title sports games, 
The NES Sports Library is honestly pretty good. I mean, a lot of these games played well for their time, with some actually having decent enough physics and precision to not feel off from the actual sport in mind. Though that's not to say that modern sports games don't beat the mountain realism, I think there's a reason why some of these are still classics in the eyes of many. I mean, Retro Bowl is like the spiritual successor of Tech Mobile, and is a very popular football game on mobile. Ice Hockey still holds out as a highly rated NES sports game, and Punch-Out! has had its own series, which hasn't seen a new release in over a decade. But hey, it's still cool they didn't just drop this one after the first game. Damn, that's truly a lot of classic titles, but the next game we'll be looking at is a true certified hood classic. One which will be pretty controversial when the video comes out. But, like I've said before, I only spit straight ass. What the hell? Hey, who the fuck changed my lines? Get a taste of the Samboni Pony!